Glory Cloud Podcast, Episode 29. Stay tuned, everyone. We are back to baptism this week. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahey, and I'm joined by our co-host, Charles Lee Irons. Welcome back, Lee. Hello, Chris. It's great to be with you again. So before we dive into our topic this week, I'll just, as usual, remind you about the uh, show notes page, which you can find at meredithkline.com slash podcast. If you would like to donate to uh, the project of funding the monthly cost of hosting the audio files for this podcast, there is a donate button on the right hand side. But the show notes page is where we put all of the resources that are mentioned in the course of the podcast. If we mention articles, we link to them wherever possible. Um, I also try to even convert those articles into audio audiobook files so that you can download those and listen to them on your mobile device. And we would like to ask you to continue to give us five-star ratings on iTunes. I'll put another link for doing that in the show notes. And I feel like I'm forgetting something. I can't think of anything else. Okay. Well, then let's get into our topic for this week. Um, we went through um, Klein's book, By Oath Consigned, um, a, a few episodes ago. We we did a whole series through By Oath Consigned, and um, we would like to revisit the topic of baptism. <clears throat> um. One thing that we did not get to in that series was the subject of the efficacy of baptism and the question of what baptism actually does. So Klein didn't explicitly address that in really any of his works, but his his argument definitely touches on that subject. And so we would like to uh, talk this week about the efficacy of baptism. And Lee, why don't you, um, why don't you get us started on that conversation? Yeah. So just uh, reminding listeners a few episodes back, um, we did uh, cover by oath consigned in episodes 12, 14 through 16 and 21 through 22 and especially those last two episodes, which covered chapters five and six of By Oath Consigned. Chapter five of By Oath Consigned is titled Christian Baptism, Oath Signed of the New Covenant. And Klein's main uh, point there is, I'll just read here a little bit from his conclusion on page 79. He says that Christian baptism is a sign of the eschatological ordeal in which the Lord of the covenant brings his servants to account. In baptismal context, this judgment is often viewed more specifically as that through which the Christian passes in Christ, in whose ordeal the final judgment of the elect was intruded into mid-history. That is, judgment is viewed in such cases only insofar as it involves the specific verdict of justification. Agreeably, the import of the baptismal sign of judgment is then expounded in soteriological terms like regeneration, sanctification, incorporation by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, or protective sealing against the day of wrath. But even when the consideration of baptism is thus restricted to its significance for the elect, judgment as curse and death remains at the center of baptism's import and continues to be the specific object of its symbolic portrayal. For the blessing of the elect arises only out of their Savior's accursed death. Okay. So I think that's a good <clears throat> summary of what Klein is getting at in uh, his understanding of baptism. And I like the fact that here he, he recognizes that, uh, that the baptismal sign uh, signifies regeneration, sanctification, incorporation by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, and so on. Uh, 
So he sees it in soteriological terms as signifying a verdict of justification. And yet, at the same time, behind it, there is this other uh, verdict of judgment, the, the judgment of, of a curse and death that is, is there in the background. And of course, the soteric blessing of justification comes to the elect only because Christ himself has taken that accursed death in our place. And therefore, we, are, uh, re- they, we receive the verdict of justification in union with Christ. But additionally, there's also a sense in which Klein is a little bit unclear because at this, at, even as he says all those wonderful things that it signifies regeneration and justification and so on, uh, he also will talk about the fact that baptism as an oath sign consigns you to the lordship of Christ for either a verdict of blessing or curse depending on whether or not you respond in faith uh, to, to the sign. And so there's this negative side as well that continues to be uh, there in the background, even though we want to say Christ took it in our place, yet what about those that are not in Christ? And so they will receive the judgment of curse and death because they are not represented by Christ. And so this raises sort of a, a little bit of a, an uncertainty, a doubt, a question mark. Uh, in what sense is Klein arguing that baptism is a positive thing? Is he saying it's just equally either way? It could go either way, either positive or negative, and it doesn't necessarily uh, convey and communicate the assurance of uh, salvation, regeneration, sanctification, justification in Christ. And so we want to address that a little bit more today. And uh, basically what we're going to say is that that I think that Klein uh, does view it as ultimately a positive thing. And that negative aspect is not to be uh, allowed to eclipse the positive. So baptism does have a positive significance for us. But at the same time, we want to sort of situate Klein's view within the context of not only Reformed theology, but also other views of baptism out there in the church, and then see how we can uh, use Klein's view to more clearly formulate a theology of baptism and specifically of baptismal efficacy. Okay. In a sense, we're going to be going a little bit beyond Klein here because Klein doesn't address that issue of baptismal efficacy explicitly in his writings. And so we're going to go a little bit beyond him and do a little bit of uh, creative work here as we bring Klein into connection with Klein, with Calvin's view. So I think we're going to argue that Calvin provides some helpful uh, emphases that will that work well with Klein if we bring the two views uh, into some kind of connection with one another. So not exactly speculation, but we will have to do a little bit of constructive work. Yes. So. Okay. So, um, within the Christian tradition, there are a range of views about, well, the sacraments, but we are focusing today on the sacrament of baptism. And um, probably, uh, well, at, at least in terms of the spectrum, as we're going to describe it, we're going to start with um, a position that we would call sacramental objectivism. Mm-hmm. Um, sacramental objectivism would say that the the grace that is conferred uh, is so objective that um, it almost nothing else matters except that the sacrament is is given to somebody. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, and. We want to just point out that this position within the church uh, is identified most closely with the Roman Catholic view, but it's not exclusively the Roman Catholic view. Uh, There are others as well. Um, The Lutheran view is somewhat similar uh, and would also fall under this category of sacramental objectivism, although we don't want to equate the Lutheran view with the Catholic view since the Lutheran view is not quite the same and has some important evangelical distinctives to it that make it a view that we would still recognize as being evangelical and Christ-centered. Uh, 
But nevertheless, there is still this tendency within these uh, sacramental objectivist views to look at the passages in the New Testament, uh, you know, like Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 22.16, when um, Ananias says to uh, Paul, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Uh, Romans 6, 3 and 4, baptism into Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, by one spirit we have all been baptized into one body. And 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism now saves us. And there are a few other passages as well. But there's a tendency to look at these New Testament texts and to take them at straight as a straightforward affirmation that baptism saves and that baptism confers grace, forgiveness, and justification. And so uh, the Roman Catholic view is that it does so um, unless there's a mortal sin that would hinder the conferral of grace and forgiveness and justification. And then the Roman Catholics would also say that this happens, they use this technical Latin phrase, ex opera operato, which just means by the work itself being performed, by the ritual itself being performed, Unless there's mortal sin hindering, it will confer grace, forgiveness, and justification. And tied in with this is the whole Roman Catholic idea that, uh, well, what if, what if you commit a mortal sin after you've been baptized? And then that puts you in a state of not being in a state of grace anymore. And so that's why they have the sacrament of penance as the second plank of salvation so that you can restore yourself back to the state of grace uh, when you commit mortal sins after baptism. But the, the basic idea here is that the Roman Catholic view says that baptism itself confers grace and that grace can be lost. Right. And then in addition to the Roman Catholic view, uh, relatively recently, um, since the dawn of the 21st century, is that fair to say? Yeah, we have uh, a new um, movement uh, out there called the Federal Vision, and there are quite a few proponents out there. But probably uh, the one who has spent the most time writing and talking about uh, baptism is Peter Lightheart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wrote a book in two thousand seven called "The Baptized Body." And he bases his whole argument on 1 Corinthians 12, 13. In one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. And you and I, Chris, and most of our listeners would say, well, that doesn't really mean anything, right? Because the body of Christ there is just the visible church, right? So being baptized into the visible church doesn't necessarily confer grace and forgiveness and so on. Right. But he would say, no, the body of Christ isn't just the visible church. The body of Christ is the body of Christ where salvation occurs. And he would say that if you are in the body of Christ, then you are united to the head. You are savingly and spiritually united to the head. Mm. And he would say that, quote, membership in Christ's body doesn't exist without a connection to the head, page 78. And he says that baptism justifies. So just like the Roman Catholic view, it confers grace, forgiveness, justification. Although he wouldn't necessarily add that qualifier of unless mortal sin hinders. I don't think he would add that statement because he doesn't hold to the whole Catholic system of mortal versus venial sins and the sacrament of penance and so on. But he still has this idea that baptism justifies. He says that the New Testament connects baptism to union with Christ and the soteriological realities of the Ordo Salutis. Hmm. And so he, he has a very strong sacramental objectivism that is very similar to the Roman Catholic view. He would say baptism is the water crossing between membership in Adam and membership in Christ. So before you're baptized, you're under the federal headship of Adam, you're under sin and guilt, you're lost, but then when you're baptized, you're transferred into Christ. And so now he is your federal head and you receive all the blessings of salvation in union with Christ. Okay. So what happens then when someone who has been baptized says, look, I just, I don't believe. 
Right. Well, he has a whole chapter in his book uh, titled Apostasy Happens. <laughs> uh, and so he would argue that those apostates, they were really baptized into the body of Christ. They really were justified, forgiven, and all that. But they now lose that. So these, apo- these are reprobates who really were joined to Christ prior to their apostasy, but now they are reprobate and no longer um, are joined to Christ. Hmm. And so he would say that you can lose the blessings of the Ordo Salutis. And there's a, a quote on page 98 where he says, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not denying the sovereignty of God in salvation. And he's not denying that some people who are baptized are not elect, right? Because if you can be baptized and then become apostate, then you must not have been elect. Right. Elect, that is elect to eternal salvation. You might be have been elected during that time when you were in the visible church or the body of Christ. You were, quote unquote, a member of the elect body, but you weren't predestined to eternal life. So he would say God foreordained that uh, that the apostates would be joined to Christ for a time and then fall away from Christ. And so he has this one quote where he says, before the foundation of the world, God scripted the whole story of union with Christ, which does not last. Wow. Page 98. Union with Christ, which does not last. Right. That's interesting. So they were in union with Christ, but then they became apostate and now they're no longer in union with Christ. And so there's a very strong similarity then between the federal vision view and the Roman Catholic view because regeneration and justification are conferred through baptism, but they can be lost. And in my view, uh, the the main problem with uh, Peter Lightheart's view is that it's just flat out incompatible with the five points of Calvinism, right? I mean, the five points of Calvinism, especially the last three, irresistible grace, and uh, limited atonement and the perseverance of the saints, they're saying that the whole point of those of the five points is that when God elects somebody and then he effectually calls them into union with Christ, that effectual calling is guaranteed. It's certain. It's been purchased by the merit of Christ, limited atonement, and it's guaranteed to continue perseverance of the saints. So all those who are savingly joined to Christ, only those who are elect are savingly joined to Christ, and all those who are savingly joined to Christ are guaranteed to remain in union with Christ, and it cannot be lost. Right. So I don't want to argue that Lightheart's view is uh, necessarily heretical, but I just think that it's incompatible with Reformed theology. And so it's ironic to me that he would take that position and say and consider himself to be reformed because you can't really be reformed if you believe that union with Christ is losable. Right. And I, you know, he was trying to be because he was trying to have the, hold these ideas, teach and preach these ideas in the context of the the PCA, correct? Right. He was a few years ago. He, he, he uh, transferred out of the PCA, but yeah, for, for a while there, for, you know, over a decade, I don't know the exact number of years, he was doing this within the PCA mm-hmm. and was even, uh, there was even a heresy trial. Uh, that term heresy trial might be a little bit too strong, but a, a trial to ascertain whether his views are consistent with the system of doctrine of the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms. And unfortunately, he was vindicated in that trial to the exasperation of many of us because <laughs> it just seems plainly obvious that his views are incompatible with Reformed theology. I know the PCA is a little bit more uh, loose in their view of confessional subscription. They hold to system subscription rather than jot and tittle subscription, which I, I agree with and I'm thankful for. But you know, it should be pretty clear that, that uh, the five points of Calvinism are part of the system of doctrine of Reformed theology. And so this idea of a temporary union with Christ that can be lost is just fundamentally strikes the vitals of, of the reform system, in my opinion. Right. Obviously, the presbytery didn't see it that way, but that, 
it seems pretty clear to many observers. Right. So I think that's that's enough discussion of Lightheart, but we just wanted to recognize that there is this position or this family of of views out there that are highly objective in their view of the sacraments and specifically of baptism and take the New Testament passages very literally and straightforwardly as saying that baptism confers grace. And the Roman Catholic view, the federal vision would also fit there. And I think the Lutheran view to some extent also belongs there, at least formally. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of the formal structure of the system, of the way the Lutheran view looks at baptism in relation to salvation. But I don't want to necessarily say that the Lutheran view is the same as the Roman Catholic view. And I do recognize that the Lutheran view has a very Christ-centered view of baptism and that the Lutheran view wants to hold the word and the water together in the tightest possible way so that when you are baptized, that's God himself speaking to you. It's his word. It's the gospel. It's Christ himself who is coming to you in the water. And so uh, it is a very evangelical and Christ-centered view. Nevertheless, the Lutheran system is very similar to the Catholic and the federal vision because of this formal structure of saying that baptism confers grace and then that grace can be lost. Mm -hmm. But, um, but Lee and I have decided that in order to do justice to describing the Lutheran view, it would just take uh, too long in the context of this particular episode. And so rather than do an injustice to the Lutheran view, we thought we would just say what we've said about it. Um, but, but not focus on that view. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's now turn to the mainstream reformed view. So here we have uh, the views of Calvin and the Westminster Confession. I'm taking those as being the best representative of the mainstream reformed view. And I really appreciate an article that was written by William B. Evans, in Presbyterian, published in 2005, titled Really Exhibited and Conferred in His Appointed Time, Baptism and the New Reformed Sacramentalism. And this article is very good because on the one hand, he expounds Calvin's view very well. He expounds the Westminster Confession's view very well. Uh, but then he also critiques the federal vision. Now, his main interlocutor in that article is uh, someone named Rich Lusk, who uh, is very close in his view to Lightheart. So he's not directly critiquing Lightheart, but uh, I think that there's enough similarity between Lusk and Lightheart that uh, it works as a critique of Lightheart as well. So when he says the new reformed sacramentalism, he's referring to the federal vision views. And another thing he's trying to do is to, to argue that that the federal vision uh, theologians have misunderstood and misrepresented Calvin and the Westminster Confession because they try to use Calvin and the Westminster Confession as ammunition to support their view. But Evans does a great job of showing that they have misappropriated their views. Evans does a great job of summarizing Calvin's view, which he calls the offer and reception model. So he's saying, Evans is saying that Calvin's view is that baptism offers the benefits of salvation. It offers Christ to us, but it, it does not automatically confer those benefits unless the offer is received and it has to be received by faith. Right. And so that leads to this terminology that uh, Evans uses that he gets from another Calvin scholar named Ronald Wallace, who wrote a book called Calvin's Doctrine of the Word and Sacrament called Latent Efficacy. So the idea is that Baptism is efficacious, but it has a latent efficacy. It doesn't necessarily, the benefits that are signified in baptism are not necessarily conferred at the moment of baptism, and therefore there can often be a latent efficacy to baptism. And uh, Evans refers us to the Institutes, Calvin's Institutes, Book 4, Chapter 15, Paragraph 17, where I'm not going to read it, but that's where Calvin specifically addresses this question. It's an objection from uh, those from his Roman Catholic 
uh, interlocutors who say, "What do you? Wh- how do you explain the fact that sometimes people will come to faith many years after their baptism? Does that mean that their baptism was in vain?" And his answer is, "No, it's still there. The promise of God is." fixed and firm and true. Uh, you know, although all men should be false, yet God ceases not to be true. It's just that uh, sometimes there's this latent efficacy where the efficacy of baptism is delayed and it's not till later that we come to believe in the promise and receive the full benefits of it. Okay. And uh, contrary to someone like Rich Lusk or Peter Lightheart who would try to use Calvin to support their view, I think it's very clear that Calvin rejected the uh, the views that we're calling the sacramental objectivist views, specifically the Roman Catholic view. Uh, I'll just give you a quote here from the Institutes. Uh, this is book four, chapter 14, the chapter before on the sacraments in general. And he says, the schools of the sophists have taught with general consent that the sacraments of the new law justify and confer grace, provided only that we do not interpose the obstacle of mortal sin. It is impossible to describe how fatal and pestilential this sentiment is, (laughs) and the more so that for for many ages it has, to the great loss of the church, prevailed over a considerable part of the world. It is plainly of the devil." It's hard to get more clear than that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's very clear that, that Calvin has no truck with that, with that position on uh, baptism. Uh, and, and the reason why Calvin was so opposed to it is because this view of baptism, the Roman Catholic view, causes people to look superstitiously to a physical ritual rather than to Christ mm-hmm. for salvation. You know, Calvin always talks about that, right? I'm sure you've noticed this in his writings. He's very um, concerned about superstition, right? Right. You know, that's like one of his things he brings up on this whole debate over the Sabbath. He's concerned about superstition there as well. Anything superstitious, anything where you're looking to something physical and external and saying that, okay, if I just do, if I just go through the ritual, then everything is right between me and God. And he's saying, no, we need to look to Christ alone for salvation. And by the way, this is why I was a little bit hesitant about including the Lutheran view under the sacramental objectivism view, even though it belongs there technically and formally. I just don't want to include it with those views because I don't think that Calvin would say that Luther's view of baptism was, uh, you know, pestilential and of the devil. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I think that Calvin would have recognized that Luther's view, even though he would have disagreed with it, uh, it's very Christ-centered and that Luther's view does not cause people to look superstitiously to something physical, but rather to Christ. So he would appreciate that element of Luther's view. Absolutely. But I love this quote, Institutes uh, 4.15.2, where he says, the very meaning of baptism leads us away from the visible element which is presented to the eye, that it may fix our minds on Christ alone. Right. And that's the heart of what Calvin is getting at. He's saying, look, there's a sign and there's a thing signified. And don't confuse the two. Don't equate the two the way the Roman Catholic view does. The sign and the thing signified are distinct. They're indispensably interconnected, but they are distinct. And the reason the sign is there is because God himself is giving us that sign in order to fix our Christ, our eyes on the thing signified, which is Christ and all of his benefits. And in that sense, Calvin and Luther are interested in the same thing. Right, exactly. That if you miss Christ in the sacrament of baptism, you've completely missed the point. You've missed the whole point. Yeah. And so he says... Um, Institutes 4, 14, 14, he says, it is an error to suppose that anything more is conferred by the sacraments than is offered by the word of God and obtained by true faith. And Luther would agree with that. Right. It's an error to suppose that anything more is conferred in the sacraments than what is already offered to us by the word of God, because the sacrament is a visible form of the word of God, and therefore it must be received by faith. And he says, from this sacrament, we gain nothing unless insofar as we receive it in faith. That's uh, 
Institutes 4, 15, 15. And so I really like Evans's, uh, William B. Evans' uh, summary of Calvin's view that it's this, uh, what he calls offer and response model or offer and reception model that Christ himself is offered in the sign, but we receive no benefit from the sign and thus we receive it in faith. Okay. It's a visible promise to us. Um, Institutes 4, 15, 17. God in baptism promises the remission of sins and will undoubtedly perform what he has promised to all believers. The promise was offered to us in baptism. Let us therefore embrace it in faith. Amen. That's a perfect summary of what Evans is saying, a perfect uh, proof text, so to speak, to support Evans's interpretation of Calvin. There's the offer, and then there's the embrace of the offer. Okay. Now, uh, fast forwarding to the Westminster Confessions, I know we're jumping over a lot of Reformed history there, but <laughs> nevertheless, that's okay. Westminster Confession, chapter 28, uh, has exactly the same view as what we just described. Uh, paragraphs 5 and 6 says, Although it be a great sin to contemn, not condemn, but contemn, which I take to mean to treat with contempt, to contemn or neglect this ordinance, yet grace and salvation are not so inseparably annexed unto it as that no person can be regenerated or saved without it, or that all that are baptized are undoubtedly regenerated. And then moving to the next paragraph, paragraph six, the efficacy of baptism is not tied to that moment of time wherein it is administered. Yet, notwithstanding, by the right use of this ordinance, the grace promised is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred by the Holy Ghost to such, whether of age or infants, as that grace belongeth unto, according to the counsel of God's own will in his appointed time. That's where Evans got the title of his article from. Uh, yeah, not only offered, but really exhibited in his appointed time. Ah, okay. And that whole paragraph is getting at the idea of latent efficacy. Right, exactly. So, And it's not denying that, that the uh, benefits of salvation might be conferred at the moment, right? Paragraph five says that. Sure. That, um, that, uh, I'm sorry, not paragraph five. Paragraph six says that uh, the grace promise is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred by the Holy Ghost, but it's not necessarily tied to the moment uh, in which uh, baptism is administered. And it is only conferred to those that that grace belongs unto, that is, to the elect, according to the counsel of God's own will. And uh, Evans has a great section in that paper, it's on page 85, where he exegetes the Westminster Confession there and specifically interacts with Rich Lusk's interpretation of it and shows that Rich Lusk is just totally off the mark. Uh, basically, Rich Lusk would say that when it says the efficacy of baptism is not tied to that moment of time wherein it is, it is administered, Lusk would say it's not limited the efficacy of baptism is not limited to that moment of time wherein is it is administered. And Evans does a great job of showing that that doesn't make sense because of the, the rest of the sentence, which says, yet notwithstanding. Right. So, yet notwithstanding, by the right use of this ordinance, the grace promised, there's the promise, is not only offered, that there it's offered to everyone. It's offered to everyone who receives the sign but it's really exhibited and conferred, but not to everyone. It's only exhibited and conferred to such as that grace belongeth unto, according to the counsel of God's own will, that is to the elect. So you have the almost the exact language of Calvin, of the offer and the conferral uh, to those who are elect. Hmm. That's true. So, yeah, so I think that Calvin and the Westminster Confession are uh, quite in sync with one another. And um, there's a distinction between the sign and the thing signified. And yet those two are not so radically separated that we're just left with a mere sign. Mm 
which is the the third view that we want to talk about, which is usually identified with the Anabaptists, um, but also even someone reformed like Zwingli, who was not an Anabaptist. He rejected rebaptism and he affirmed infant baptism. In fact, he was one of the first ones to make that argument about the parallel between circumcision and baptism right. as an argument for infant baptism. Nevertheless, Zwingli, in his strong reaction against the Roman Catholic view, almost went too far and turned baptism into a mere sign. So he said that, uh, quote unquote, water baptism cannot contribute in any way to the washing away of sin. That's a pretty strong statement. Yeah. So it's just a complete separation. Water mm-hmm. baptism and the washing of sin are just totally unrelated to each other. And the one does not contribute to the other in any way. And you can understand why. I mean, he's reacting against the Roman Catholic view at that point. Mm-hmm. But he's going too far, much farther than Calvin would go. He basically defined baptism as a sacramentum. That's the Latin word where we get sacrament from. But originally, a sacramentum in, in Latin meant an oath of allegiance. You know, when, when a soldier is signing up for the army, he would make an oath of allegiance to the general to say that he will go into the battle and be loyal and so on. Mm-hmm. And so he says that's what baptism is. He says baptism is an initiatory sign or pledge initiating us to a lifelong mortification of the flesh and engaging or pledging us like the soldier at his enlistment. Wow, that really is like the Anabaptist view that it's just our our badge of profession. Yeah, it's just our profession of faith. Hmm. So that the world can see that we belong to Christ. But it's not a means of grace and uh, it does not offer or confer uh, the benefits of salvation to those that receive it by faith. Okay. Well, very different from Calvin. Right. All right. So we've, we've covered the whole spectrum of views of baptism within the Christian tradition. So let's turn to the discussion of how Klein fits into that spectrum. So I think that at first glance, we might be tempted to classify Klein along with Zwingli, mm-hmm. right? Especially because of this language of baptism being an oath of allegiance, which Klein himself uses that language right? and, sa- and says that that's what it is. It's a, an oath sign that consigns us to the Lordship of Christ for either blessing or curse. And so you might be tempted to say, oh, Klein is just a Zwinglian. But I think a case can be made that he fits in the middle with Calvin. Uh, We've got these three views, the objectivist view, Calvin's view, and the mere sign view. And so we're putting Calvin right there in the middle as the offer and reception model. And I think that that Klein fits there. Uh, Klein, like Calvin, recognized that baptism is essentially a promise that must be received by faith. And let me quote you from By Oath Consigned, page 82. He says, even though the waters portray the judgment curse, the right does not prejudge the ultimate issue of the individual's destiny one way or the other. It places him under the the authority of the Lord for judgment and tells him that as a sinner, he must pass through the curse. Yet, here's the key part, it also calls him to union with his Lord, promising to all who are found in Christ a safe passage through the curse waters of the ordeal. That does sound very similar to Calvin. Yeah, that word promising, right? Right. (laughs) There's an offer there. It's It's a call. It calls him to union with his Lord, promising safe passage through the curse waters. And on the other hand, we can also point out that Calvin himself approaches Klein to some extent. Even though Calvin did not emphasize the two-sided nature of baptism leading to either blessing or curse to the same extent that Klein did, yet he did recognize it. For example, in Institutes 4, 14, 14, he says, for what is a sacrament received without faith, but most certain destruction to the church? Mm. The promise no less denounces wrath to the unbeliever than offers grace to the believer. Yeah, you do get the two sides there. There's the two sides. Mm -hmm. And then also in 
4, 15, 15, he says, From this sacrament, as from all others, we gain nothing unless insofar as we receive in faith. If faith is wanting, it will be an evidence of our ingratitude by which we are proved guilty before God for not believing the promise there given. Okay. So what I want to argue is that Calvin and Klein belong together, even though Klein is emphasizing the double-sided nature of baptism much more than Calvin, yet they do belong together in this, this middle position. Klein is not a Zwinglian. He's a Calvinian in his view of baptism. <laughs> and so I think that these two views, Klein's view and Calvin's view, are complementary and need one another and can be brought together into a wonderful harmony that, uh, that can be useful and beneficial for the church. So Calvin's emphasis on the positive significance of baptism as a sign and seal, assuring us that we are partakers of Christ and his benefits is valid, but it needs to be supplemented by Klein's more expansive development of the two-sided nature of baptism. Mm. The promise can be received in faith or it can be rejected in unbelief, which Calvin himself affirms. Baptism does not guarantee salvation but consigns us to the covenantal lordship of Christ for a judicial ordeal with an outcome of either justification or judgment. And so, you know, I think that we need to listen to, to what Klein is saying there and, and, you know, really bring that out. I think that's, that's part of what we need today, especially in light of this whole federal vision view of baptism that has come up. I think Klein provides a very strong corrective to that. Right. And uh, you can correct me if, uh, if you disagree with me here, but I, the way I read Klein and Bioth Consigned is that there is a sense in, in which he's got something objective going on, that someone who's baptized really does encounter Christ, mm-hmm. but yeah. it's, it's either Christ as Savior or Christ as judge. Yeah, absolutely. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, Klein would definitely say that there is an ex opera operato aspect to baptism. And that is that by, by baptism, we are actually brought into a covenant relationship with God through mm-hmm. Christ. But that covenant relationship is a conditional covenant that requires faith in order to receive the benefits. Right. Okay. The covenant of grace is not unconditional. I know that some people have argued that that's what Klein is saying. They think that that's what Klein is saying. They, they view Klein as an antinomian. He's saying that the covenant of grace is unconditional. He's not. He's saying the covenant of grace is conditional, and the condition is faith. <laughs> right. He just wanted to be careful about how we said that. He was also right. always <laughs> scrupulous about language and, and the way it was used. Well, right, if, in terms of defining different types of conditions. Mm-hmm. It's not the conditionality of... A covenant of works, it's the conditionality of a covenant of grace in which faith is the instrument by which we receive the ben- the blessings, but it's not a meritorious uh, conditionality. Right. But he would say that baptism does place you into the covenant lordship of Christ. Yes. So there's a sense in which he would agree with, with Lightheart at this one point that when Lightheart wants to look at first Corinthians twelve thirteen and say, aha, that's the key to baptism by one spirit. We were all baptized into one body. Klein would agree, but he would just say the body of Christ there is the visible church. Right. <laughs> and so the circle of the covenant or the visible church is larger than the circle of election within it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because someone can be, cut off from that larger That's right. circle of the church. That's right. And so we have to acknowledge that the federal vision theologians have done us uh, a favor in this sense, that they have raised that question of what is apostasy? Mm-hmm. You know, the, it is, an apostate is not the same thing as an unbeliever who's outside of the covenant. An apostate is someone that was a part of the covenant and has rejected it. And that is something different. And there, there is something very significant about that. You know, when we pray for, I mean, just looking just pastorally and practically at the church, right? We have covenant children that grow up into their teens and college age, and they wander away from the church. Mm -hmm. And 
how do we view them? Do we just view them as well that they're just no li- they're no different than any other unbeliever out there that was never a part of the church? No, no, no they are sheep that have wandered from the fold. They they and so our prayer for them is that that the latent efficacy of baptism would be there and would that the Spirit would use that to uh, convince them that they need to come back to Christ. And so apostasy is a much more serious sin than uh, just being an ordinary non-covenantal unbeliever. Mm. And that's what the Federal Vision is trying to point out. And so we should always view those that are either apostates or who have wandered from the church or who are wandering from their faith, we should view them as in a distinct category uh, than those that were never a part of the church. Right. Right, because they were um, sacramentally, covenantally related to, to Christ. Right. It's as if they have they have the mark of God's ownership upon them. Mm-hmm. And so even though they might be wandering for years and years, God has still put that mark upon them, you know? And who knows, after years and years of wandering, they may come back. Right. And that's our prayer for them is that they would, that they would come back. Absolutely. And, you know, that they would rejoice to return to the fold again and and that they would say yes all those years i was far from the lord but he never completely left me Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know i was still under his banner i was still under that oath and yes of course there is that greater danger right that if they never do come back then you know as the author of hebrews says how much severe punishment do you think they'll be worthy of but we should always hold out that hope that they will return to the lord Right. And so when they do come back, on the day that they come back, we're not going to be saying, wow, it's so great that you finally got saved. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's a different situation. So, uh, so I think that Calvin's emphasis on the positive significance of baptism is good, but it needs to be supplemented by Klein's more expansive development of the two-sided nature of baptism. On the other hand, there's an element of Klein that I think needs to be somewhat corrected as well. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with Klein when he says things like this. For example, on page 90 of Bioth Consigned, he says, when covenant is no longer identified with election and guaranteed blessing, okay, that part I completely agree with, Mm -hmm. and especially when the baptismal sign of incorporation into the covenant is understood as pointing without prejudice. That's the part I don't like as pointing without prejudice to a judgment ordeal with the potential of both curse and blessing. Yeah. That really leaves you with the sense that it just is what it is and could go either way. Could go either way. And baptism could symbolize curse or blessing. And it's taking away that strong Christ centered assurance aspect that Calvin is so clear on. Right. You know, Calvin is saying, look, it's, When you look at your baptism, that's God himself assuring you that you are indeed savingly joined to Christ and that, you know, that whole section that he has there in in book four, chapter 15, paragraph 14, where he says, look, use this, this rule. He calls it the surest rule of the sacraments that, you know, that as surely as the sign is exhibited to your eye, so surely is this thing signified being uh, communicated to you. And so you are to receive it in that in that way as from God himself as his token of assurance to you given to nourish and confirm your faith God himself is speaking to you by means of the sign he's saying I am your God I have saved you you are in union with Christ you have undergone the the judgment ordeal in union with Christ mm-hmm. you have been submerged in the ark not in the waves outside the ark but in the ark and you have gone through the judgment in Christ and so that positive preaching, that's what baptism is doing. It's God himself preaching to you and proclaiming to you that you are indeed united to Christ. And so saying that without prejudice, it just points to a judgment ordeal with the potential of blessing or curse takes away from that assurance. Mm. And I think that Klein's view needs to be supplemented a little bit from Calvin at that point. Right. That, yeah, uh, contra Calvin, that's... Uh, taking your eyes off of Christ and looking back to the sign. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's it. 
Yeah. And I think that there are resources within Klein's own thinking to do this because if you recall, in Bioth Consigned, on several occasions, he says that the proper purpose, he uses this technical term, the proper mm. purpose, he says the proper purpose of the covenant of grace is the salvation of the elect. Right. So even though the covenant of grace does contain within it those who are not elect, right, the, the circle of the covenant or the visible church is bigger than the circle of the elect within it. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, he wants to say, as true as that is, let's not lose sight of the fact that the proper purpose of the covenant of grace is the salvation of the elect, <laughs> right? Right. And so I think that he could have said the same thing about baptism as the sign and seal of the covenant of grace. He could have said, he doesn't say this, so we're putting words in his mouth here, we're doing a little bit of creative, constructive theology, but he could have said the proper purpose of baptism is not judgment, but yeah. to assure us that we are united to Christ and that we do receive washing, cleansing, forgiveness, and righteousness, and so on in him. Amen. I think that's a faithful understanding of Klein's total system. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what Klein should have said, and I think that's what he is trying to say, <laughs> right. even though he didn't say it in those words. But um, having said that, we don't want to deny Klein's point that for someone who um, does firmly reject the faith after having been baptized, that it does symbolize uh, judgment for that person. Yeah, and as long and if they die in the state of rejecting right. Christ, then yeah, it, that that is what it will be for them because they're outside of Christ. They're not undergoing the judgment sign in Christ. They're undergoing the judgment outside of Christ. Mm -hmm. So then they've been united with Christ as judge. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> okay. So there you have it. That's, that's, that's my take on Calvin and Klein and coming with a, coming up with some sort of a, um, a combined view where we take the good parts of Klein and the good parts of Calvin and we bring them together and we read Klein uh, in light of Calvin and as actually supporting Calvin. And the one thing where I think it's really helpful is that Calvin is a little bit weak in recognizing that there is a judicial ordeal there and that the way in which that judicial ordeal becomes blessing for us is our union with Christ who underwent the judgment in our place. Right. That particular part, which is so clear in Klein, is not as strong in Calvin. So mm -hmm. he'll just talk about the water purely as a positive thing, as the water that cleanses. Mm -hmm. You know, so just as surely as you see your body washed with water, so you should be assured that your soul is washed in the blood of Christ. And that's true. Right. But we don't want to forget that the way in which water becomes a, a positive thing that washes and cleanses is, first of all, by being a judicial thing that judges and curses. <laughs> Amen. And so, yeah, that, that's the part that, that is a little bit unclear in Calvin. And, and Klein will just make that come out so clearly. He, mm -hmm. He'll just make that shine. <laughs> that Christ you know? is the anti-typical arc. That's right. And you need to be in Christ in order for that water to benefit you. Yeah. And, and that's why uh, Klein is so helpful because he connects it all to circumcision mm -hmm. and to the flood and all that to show us there's this whole judicial context there that then gets fulfilled in Christ, the circumcision of Christ, the baptism of Christ, and so on. Right. Okay. So... Where does that leave us then? Well, just one thing that I would like to close with is to return back to those verses that we quoted at the very beginning. Uh, remember we quoted Acts 2.38, mm -hmm. Acts 22.16, etc. Mm -hmm. All the passages that the sacramental objectivists look to, the Roman Catholics, the Federal Vision, even the Lutherans will look to those verses and say, see, Baptism saves us. See, baptism actually unites us to Christ, Romans 6, 3. And so I just want to return to that and just ask the question, um, 
how do we deal with those verses? And uh, I think that the answer is that uh, all of these positive verses that so strongly say, if you take them literally, that baptism saves us or washes or justifies, um, I think that they are, the best way to interpret them is that they are the artifacts of the New Testament's baptismal preaching. Mm. The New Testament, especially you see this in, in the epistles and especially in Paul, right. addresses the baptized community as those who are in Christ. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's unwilling to address them as um, even possibly being outside of Christ. Well, he does recognize theoretically that's possible, you know, but, but he doesn't dwell on that. He calls them to live up to their union with Christ. Right. It's like, because you've been baptized, I'm going to address you um, as Christians. That's right. Not as non-Christians. And you see this very clearly in first Corinthians. First Corinthians begins, and remember who he's addressing here. Mm -hmm. This is a church that has major issues. Right. Right. I mean, there's a man who's sleeping with his his uh, father's wife. You've got all kinds of just horrible things, disunity and fighting and factionalism. And yet he addresses them as First Corinthians one, verse two, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified. In Christ Jesus, mm-hmm. called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord. So he calls them sanctified in Christ. And I think that's a baptismal term because if you read on in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, he ties it into baptism. He says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And so there's this whole indicative imperative aspect to the way that Paul addresses the visible church. The visible church, which has been baptized, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we have all been baptized into one body. He addresses them as those to whom the thing signified in baptism is a reality. He addresses them as those who are sanctified, washed, and justified. Even though he recognizes that, you know, don't be deceived, you know, that those who commit these sins that he mentions there in verses nine through 10 uh, and live in them without repentance, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he even says to the Corinthians later on in first Corinthians 15, that uh, he says to their shame that there are some of you who do not know God. Uh, That's first Corinthians 15 verse 34. Some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Mm -hmm. So he's recognizing that within the visible church, there are some who are not elect He warns them in 1 Corinthians 10 that just as all the Israelites were baptized into Moses, yet with most of them, God was not pleased, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 5. So theoretically, there is a distinction between the circle of the covenant and the circle of election. But in terms of how he addresses them, he addresses them as those who are saved. Mm -hmm. And this is how baptism functions as a means of grace. It not only assures us of our union with Christ, but it calls us to live as those who are united to Christ. It's not only the indicative, you are in Christ, you've died with Christ, you've gone through the waters of judgment, you've been raised with him into newness of life, but it also calls us through the imperative to live in light of the reality of the indicative. Amen. You know, you see that very clearly in Romans 6. Mm where Paul addresses the question, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, or perhaps more accurately in the name of Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Yeah, that that passage is one of my favorite passages to use to illustrate the indicative and the imperative. Mm -hmm. It's just so clear. Right. So that to me is the explanation for why there are these verses in the New Testament that speak so realistically and almost talk as if the thing signified in the sign are equated with one another. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's, it's, not, it's not to be taken literally. It's what the confession calls a sacramental relation or a sacramental union between the sign and the thing signified 
whence it comes to pass that the names and effects of the one are attributed to the other. That's Confession 27, paragraph 2. Um, that's, that's what's going on there. It's sacramental language, but that sacramental language is rooted in the indicative imperative preaching of the epistles in which the church is addressed on the basis of their baptism. Mm. That's helpful. Well, um, that, that was rich. Uh, leaves me um, thankful that Christ has undergone God's judgment for me. Amen. And that um, I'm forgiven and justified only uh, for the sake of Christ and his perfect life, death, and resurrection. Um, is there anything else we need to cover before we wrap up? No, I think that covers it. All right. Thank you very much, Lee, for um, doing all that work on uh, Calvin and um, tying um, the best of, of Calvin and Klein together. Um, appreciate that very much. All right, everyone. Um, I hope that you uh, benefited from, from this. Um, and if you're uh, a pastor, um, I'll appeal to you to address your, your congregation uh, the way that the, the New Testament writers do. Um, as Lee and I were just uh, talking about from the, the New Testament passages that deal with baptism and, and how that's behind the way uh, Paul especially uh, addresses churches. So let us know what you think about Klein and the efficacy of baptism. Send us voicemail or email us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com and we will see you next week. 